why did the Beatles break up and the Rolling Stones carry on? Or why did the Rolling Stones survive and the Beatles didn't? So this is a topic that I've not really seen explored before. Maybe it's because it's not worth exploring. I don't know, it's fairly... At the end of the day, I suppose it's fairly arbitrary. You know, you might as well ask, why did you two stick together and why did Talking Heads break up? You know, the Beatles and the Stones were two different bands cut from very different cloths in many ways. And you could argue that they just happened to come up at about the same time as each other or exactly at the same time as each other. Achieve success very closely to each other in time. Beatles first, obviously, Stones second but um, the Beatles and the Stones became uh, tied together by history, by chance, uh, the two biggest bands uh, of the 60s, the two biggest bands in the world and um, the Stones were I guess groomed to be the dark side of the Beatles by Andrew Luke Oldham, their manager and there were all kinds of strange power dynamics happening between the two bands as the 60s went on. I'll just start by saying that I don't think that anything that happened with either the Beatles or the Stones really was um, necessary. I don't think it was inevitable. I think things could have gone different differently for each of them. I think the Stones could have broken up by the same token. I think the Beatles could have survived. I don't think there was anything inbuilt into either band that was going to necessarily uh, lead them uh, one way or the other. But um, I suppose I'll start by just exploring how the two bands were similar. I mean, they were both young, music-obsessed, adrenaline-pumped guys. Liverpool, obviously the home of the Beatles in um, northern England. The Stones were a London band, really, or a southern band at least. Both very, very into music, obviously. It sounds a bit silly to uh, state something so obvious, but the Stones and the Beatles as they were growing up, you know, the various members, they were totally and utterly committed to the idea of music as a way of life, as a lifestyle choice, as a career, as um, a calling, an aspiration, equally charged by the idea of um, maybe not fame as such, but definitely success. I think the Beatles were a bit different in that I think maybe they were chasing fame a little bit more than the Stones were. I think the Stones principally were chasing the music, really, and the fame came to them um, sort of by accident, although I do think they took some calculated steps um, a bit later on after they'd seen the huge success that the Beatles had had. But... Um, so yeah, they were quite they were quite similar in many ways, musically different actually, and this probably will go on to uh, define some of my argument. There's this constant debate that rages, you know, were the Beatles better, were the Stones better? Who do you prefer, the Beatles or the Stones? It's entirely subjective, uh, not a particularly interesting um, debate, I don't think. But musically, I think the Beatles were they were kind of all-round entertainers really clearly they've been reared on early rock and roll music country music living in a liverpool seaport all, all sorts of influences coming through i mean they were certainly very heavily into rock and roll they were into motown soul music and uh, a little bit of blues music on the side but i don't think it was too heavily into their dna maybe a little bit later as we got into the 60s mccartney got turned on to bb king uh, a bit later but certainly in the early 60s the blues were not that important and also the Beatles had all these other influences jostling for position the British musical side of things that McCartney was so keen on you know the 1930s style dance tunes he was already writing um, when I'm 64 when he was I think it was 14 uh, on his on his dad's piano the Stones meanwhile were blues enthusiasts first and foremost they were blues purists which is I think a, a quite an important fact to consider they were rock and roll fans too to be fair but the blues was certainly their calling and I think maybe that's one of one of the reasons we can start to explore now for why the Stones survived I think with the Rolling Stones I think they always had a bit of a manifesto or they always had an extremely clear musical direction in mind you know a blues band dedicated to performing the blues to understanding the blues interpreting the blues and then even when they started writing their own songs and penning their own material the blues thing was you know very heavily in there Yes, they did branch out and they did start getting into more, uh, well, you know, different territory, soul music, country music, gospel music. You know, when they got to Exile on Main Street, there was a real musical stew going on. 
Uh, but uh, the blues, I think the blues was a calling for them, and that never left them, I don't think. You know, on their new album, uh, on Hackney Diamonds, the record finishes with the Muddy Waters cover, and that, that has always been very firmly in their DNA. I don't think the Beatles were ever quite as bound together by one particular musical avenue. They were, they were gadflies in a way. They liked to experiment and to synthesise, as did the Stones, to be fair on them, but, you know, the Beatles, I don't think the Beatles had a very clear-cut... Um, musical identity in the way that the Stones did and maybe that's one reason why the Stones were able to kind of cleave together. I think to this day uh, Mick and Keith still think of the Stones as being a blues band carrying on that grand tradition, you know, all those blues masters who lived to be 150 years old, Muddy Waters, John Lee Hooker, these guys who lived to, to grand old ages, you know, B.B. King. Uh, so there's there's one there's one theory that I'll throw into the mix there that the, that the Stones' longevity maybe came out of this greater sense of, of a shared a shared collective artistic vision whereas the Beatles were always a little bit more fragmented you know as the, as the 60s progressed you had George getting into the Indian music you had uh, Paul getting perhaps more and more into um, into the experimental side of things as did John and um, you know Paul had his musical side so um, yeah, so next then I suppose we've got to talk about the fame and I think I think in this regard I think there is a very big difference between the Beatles and the Stones. I think I think both bands were famous, both bands were world famous, both bands changed the world in a way, but I do think that the Beatles' fame was on a totally different level to the Stones. It was far bigger, it was far broader, it was far more wide reaching. I mean, the Beatles were not just a very, very famous rock band or a very, very f um, influential pop group. They were a cultural phenomenon. You know, Beatlemania, the world had never seen the like uh, of that, really. And also, they were the first to do it. So they were, they kicked the door in and the Stones came running in afterwards, as the old cliche goes. But, um, I think the pressure of the Beatles' fame was probably greater than that which had been bestowed on the Stones. I mean, the Beatles were ushered straight into the inner sanctum of the British mainstream entertainment industry, really. You know, they, they performed for the Royal Family, they were on TV variety shows, they became a family entertainment machine, really. They were part of the scenery and all the stuff that went with that, the pressures of having to attend, you know, gala dinners and having to meet this person, meet that person, um, be ushered into the VIP suites of uh, various palaces and hotels and having to be on their best behaviour and having to be the Beatles with the matching haircuts and huge amounts of pressure, I think, um, came to bear on them. The Stones, on the other hand, where I think... Um, were the outsiders and I think because of that there was maybe a bit less pressure on them when they first broke big um, they were the dark side of the Beatles they were the guys who took leaks on uh, garage forecourts and got into trouble they were hell raisers and uh, they were not kind of sucked into the establishment the way the Beatles were and I think because of that they were able to operate more more as a kind of independent entity and maybe they were able to maybe even keep a bit more musical integrity. Um, not sure how far you'd want to go with that, but the Stones, I think, definitely had had more freedom, had more autonomy. They were less, they were less constrained um, by the pressures of their fame. Now, um, talking about the pressures of fame, obviously, this, this caused the Beatles to, to stop playing live, really, and you can't underestimate what a, what a huge impact that had on their career. The, the mid and the late period of the Beatles is is quite right uh, quite rightly prized now by by music fans and Beatles fans. You know the, the era when they went when they withdrew into the studio and just became a studio band. But um, I think as far as the Stones are concerned, you know they definitely um, were able to keep keep the mojo a bit more. I think by being a live band, continuing to play live. You know it's interesting that as the Beatles were falling apart at the end of the sixties that's when the Stones really started to gear up properly. You know, the 60s package tours hadn't done a very good job, really, of representing live rock music. Famously, the Beatles played at Shea Stadium and they played through the PA system, you know. It was just an absolutely crazy scene, really, where there was no proper amplification for the instruments. And pop and rock music was seen, really, as being just a kind of adjunct to the variety industry, really. It was just a form of entertainment. By the late 60s, as the Beatles were starting to um, fall to pieces, the Stones were starting to invest heavily in very big PA systems. They were gearing up for uh, some pretty big major touring. 
and uh, of course that then carried on into the early 70s and the Stones just became an absolute juggernaut and absolutely just a live concert staple and they seemed to pull together in a way uh, at that point at the end of the 60s that made it clear to the world that they were not going to be they were not going to go down with the 60s I think there was I think it was clear to Mick and Keith that the Stones the Stones were not as tied down to the 1960s as the Beatles had been. The Beatles seemed to be a 60s phenomenon. The Stones, I think, were very clear in their minds at the end of the 60s. No, no, we are going to be, we are going to, I think probably in Mick's mind, you know, we are going to revolutionise rock performance. We're going to become a huge stadium rock attraction. So um, I think a, a strong grasp of uh, careerist realism on the part of the Stones, whereas the Beatles um, maybe were not so interested in that and they had all these pressures coming to bear on them anyway. Intraband dynamics, I think, were very different between the Stones and the Beatles. Um, this is a huge topic and not one that I can possibly hope to do justice to here, but just a couple of observations. Mick and Keith in the Stones were great collaborators. They wrote songs together. I think famously, what used to happen is, is you know, Keith would play um, chords on his guitar, and he would sing these quite amorphous vocal lines, or he would sing one line. He'd, you know, he'd just go Angie, and then Mick would have to interpret that and put flesh on the bone. And they would, you know, they would work collaboratively. John and Paul uh, did work collaboratively, obviously, but that that gradually changed as time went on, and they were not like Mick and Keith. They had their own musical interests, their own musical styles, and I think there was a competitiveness between Paul and John, which maybe didn't exist between Mick and Keith, uh, which was always going to cause trouble. Then you had the issue of the third member, so George Harrison uh, in the Beatles and in the Stones, of course. You had um, Brian Jones. Now, Brian wasn't a songwriter, mm -hmm. Brian, unlike George, went off the rails and the Stones were basically able to jettison him from the band, really. They were able to, if you think of him being almost like a gangrenous limb, they were just able to chop it off quite ruthlessly, get Mick Taylor in, change the line-up. That never seemed to be an issue with the Beatles. It never seems to be an option for the Beatles, rather. I know I know when, when, when George stormed out of the band uh, during the, I think it was the White Album sessions or the Let It Be sessions, I think it was the Get Back sessions, John famously said, well, you know, let's just get Eric Clapton in. But I think that was really him being facetious, really. I don't think there was ever any question that the Beatles could be anybody except John, Paul, George and Ringo. So Brian was Brian was cut loose and that kind of helped, helped the Stones to gain a new identity, it helped them to transform. In the Beatles' case, it was more problematic. George was not kicked out. Uh, he did he did try to leave, and he wasn't happy with the way he was treated in the Beatles. There was a, you know, unlike Brian, he you know he was a songwriter, and he didn't feel like he'd been given enough support by John and Paul. And certainly, as the sixties came to an end, I think there was some fairly major resentments building up. Um, so. Yeah, so before I kind of wrap up, I mean, you know, there were certain flashpoints for the Stones. There were there were certain moments where things could have gone wrong for them. You know, they went uh, to um, France at the start of the 1970s. They became tax exiles. Things could have gone pear-shaped then. Keith's heroin addiction could have dragged him down. It sort of did in a way, but he was able to pull back from that. And then later on, of course, Mick and Keith had, uh, had their own very, very public falling out during the Dirty Work era and... Um, they became they became very hostile to each other. They slagged each other off in the press, much as 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 Paul and John had done a few years before. But then once again, I think whatever it was, that careerist thing kicked in. They they didn't want to lose the Stones. They saw the Stones as being um, maybe to sound a bit cynical, maybe a bit of a cash cow. Mick and Keith, I don't think ever really were major stars on their own. Mick had a few nice solo albums here and there. Keith did a couple of nice albums, but they were not major stars on their own. I think they knew that in a way that, you know, Paul, you know, Paul McCartney clearly became a major star in his own right in the 1970s. And uh, George as well for two or three years at the start of the 70s was a very major, a extremely major figure on the world stage, just on his own. And John, of course, obviously was a major figure, you know, writing Imagine only a a couple of years after the band broke up, it was it was fairly clear that all you know all three of them were going to have were going to have major solo careers. I don't think that was ever going to be the case for Mick and Keith. I think they needed the identity of the Stones. So um, I guess finally I'll just say the Stones didn't fall out over business and they didn't fall out over women. <laughs>
and uh, maybe that's what you've been screaming at the screen <laughs> throughout this video that's the most obvious thing you know that's the elephant in the room really the stones uh, had some business problems they had um, Alan Klein managing them at one point of course but they didn't fall out over it they didn't um, they didn't drift into different opposing camps in the same way that the Beatles allowed themselves to and Mick and Keith never really brought their wives into the studio so the whole wife thing never happened you know the Yoko Linda thing never seemed to be an issue and uh, famously John I mean John Lennon always was always quite dismissive of the Stones you know he always said that uh, you know it's time it's time at some point that you grow up and stop being a gang and I think when John when John found Yoko he realized he wanted to spread his wings and do different things Paul didn't want the Beatles to end but he'd found Linda as well and when he realized that the Beatles were going to come to an end you know he embraced a solo career as well George I don't think had any any interest in being in the Beatles even by about 1967 I think he'd had enough so in the you know I think in the case of the Beatles none of them was interested in that gang mentality and cleaving together in repeating themselves or trying to evolve the Beatles thing I think um, I think all three of them or four of them with Ringo I think I think Ringo would have liked to have got back you know I think uh, I think that's become clear over the years that Ringo would have said yes anytime there was a reunion but you know, lots of it, like I said at the start of the video, lots of it is, is chance really. You know, the Beatles nearly got back together on several occasions. The Rolling Stones nearly broke up on several occasions. So things could have been different. But um, that's that's kind of how it panned out. But uh, I thought it'd be quite a good topic to do because the Beatles and the Stones obviously are both uh, on the scene again at the moment. With the Beatles, uh, the new single has just come out, which is which is okay. It's quite nice. I don't think it's anything too special. And the Stones album, uh, Hackney Diamonds. Again, I think it's okay. I, I don't think it's as great as people are saying it is, but um, it's all right. It's all right, you know. So. Um, Anyway, so yes, I'd be glad to know what people think of this of this debate. Why did the Beatles not survive? Why did the Stones manage to do it? Um, those are my theories, that's my interpretation, and I'm sticking with it. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.